Okay, as you see, uh, this is the presentation prepared with my our Eva and Eva's and mine colleague Krzysztof Opaliński, and now uh, Dr. Alexandra Valkiewicz is reading. The Dictionary of 16th Century Polish Language is uh, quite a monumental project, part of a larger project, which is aimed at documenting the historical form of the Polish language from the very beginning, from the first text until today. So there are actually three dictionaries of historical Polish. The first one is the Dictionary of Old Polish, which includes the first Polish texts all the way down to 15th century. This dictionary has been finished, it's complete, um, and it, com it contains 12 volumes. Then we have the topic of today's conversation, which is the 16th century Polish dictionary. So far, 37 volumes have been completed, uh, including the entries beginning with A through R. And then we have the electronic dictionary of 17th and 18th century Polish, which are only available in electronic forms. And obviously you have a lot of contemporary Polish dictionaries. Now, 16th century was actually quite an important era in the development of the Polish language. It is called the golden age of Polish culture. It is at that time that the Polish intellectual elites actually consciously promoted the Polish language. So Latin continued to be used, but Polish became the official language, the language of science, the language of administration. And so um, people tried to expand the existing vocabulary also in the important domains of science and administration. And this is why it was so important today to document this stage of the development of Polish language. So the project we are talking about was initiated in 1949 by Professor Maria Maganova and the Department of the Dictionary of the 16th Century Polish Language, which is part of the Institute of Literary uh, Research in the Polish Academy of Science was created. So the first stage was um, choosing the documents to be described. So 273 canonical texts were chosen, all of them obviously representing 16th century texts. Um, it was carefully chosen so that they represent different areas or, or different domains, such as law, religion, medicine, uh, agriculture and others. Most of them were printed documents, but there were also some manuscripts so that they represent as many different topics and as many different social styles as possible. Obviously, they included documents of the Royal Office, Bible translations and literature. Now, all of these texts have been transliterated and cards or fish as we call them were created and then these cards were grouped so that they represent the entries of the future dictionary on the screen you can see an example of such card so the entries skura leather or skin and this is a drawer from our archives or our file uh, with different entries for example fiatro is a bucket and fiara is fate and so on. So this paper file or this archive uh, or the land of drawers, as we call them, was created and it consists of 8 million cards, which include from 80 to 100,000 individual lexemes. Now, dictionary entries are being edited based on these cards. So these cards are, each of them is analyzed manually by a human, so by, by a, a member of the department. Um, and then the entries are created based on the analysis of that. Um, the dictionary um, is um, edited or, or published in a printed form and each of the volume contains about 500 pages. The paper version of the dictionary is still in progress. So far, 37 volumes have been published. They contain about 70,000 entries. 
uh, starting with the letters A through R. So as you can see, uh, there's still much to be done. This project has been uh, ongoing for years and will probably take um, a few decades more. Now, uh, let us uh, look back a little bit to the chronology of the project um, and um, from the from the moment it started to the um, projects that we have for the future. So, as I said before, the works began in 1949. The first stage was to uh, gather or to create the corpus. Uh, right now, there are eight million occurrences, so eight million cards, but new uses are constantly being found. So as we analyze those texts and as we add some new texts to the canonical texts that we had analyzed before, new uses are being found and the, uh, the file itself is being expanded. The first volume, the first printed volume was published in 1966 and um, in 2020, uh, we are in the process of publishing volume 38, which is available as a preprint in the digital repository, but is also going to be printed in the paper version. But obviously this paper version in the modern times has become a little insufficient or a little old fashioned. So since 2003, works on different forms of digitalization began and uh, the dictionary will from now on be available also in uh, different forms, um, different digital forms. So there are three versions of the dictionary online that can be accessed. Um, the first one is simply scanned images so the dictionary has been scanned and you can browse through the scanned file and it can be found in the digital library of Kuyavia and Pomerania, so of the uh, Torun region, let's, let's say. Um, this is the address where you can access the dictionary. And obviously you can, you can um, browse each volume of the dictionary page by page as the scanned documents go. The second version that is available is actually more sophisticated because it's quite <laughs> time consuming and discouraging for some readers to browse the scanned versions. Um, so the scanned documents were then uh, subjected to the optical character recognition, so OCR technique or process and a corpus of about 33 million segments was created. Now, this allows uh, for the reader to browse in a more advanced way. There is a search ending uh, created in the chair of formal linguistics at the University of Warsaw. The original Polycarp search ending has been adapted to the needs of the 16th century dictionary. Uh, and this is the address where you can find the search engine and browse to the dictionary. The third version, which is uh, even more sophisticated or more useful to the reader, is just the text version. Now, this obviously is very time consuming. This is um, quite a sophisticated process, turning these OCRs or these scan texts into something that is easier for the reader to use. But now the dictionary, parts of the dictionary are available in the standard text version. Now, data is um, um, put in in the XML format and the dictionary may be browsed yeah. freely. You, should, you have a search engine that is uh, a little more advanced than in uh, option number two. This is the internet address where you can find the dictionary and browse through the entries. So this, this is what it looks like. As you can see, there's an alphabetical list of all of the entries, entries and there is some advanced search which allows for a more oriented and more concrete uh, research for what you're looking for. A list of entries, the entry that is interesting to us, then you can click on it. And this is what it looks like. So this is the entry. 
this is the inflection. Now, the forms that are here are simply the forms that have been found in the text. So if there were some, as you can, uh, as you probably know, Polish has cases. And if some case forms were missing or if some verb forms were missing in the text or have not been found in the text, the paradigm has not been completed. So what you have here is actually only what we have found in the actual text. Then you have the meanings. Sometimes there's more than one meaning. And then when you click in here, a full entry appears. Now, in a full entry, you obviously have an explanation of the word in contemporary Polish. You have its Latin equivalents. You have a number of occurrences of each word in the database because our dictionary is a statistical dictionary. So we note very um, precisely how many times a word was found. There's a list of grammar forms, as I said, not the complete paradigm, but only the forms that have been found in the text. There's a list of typical syntactic structures and a list of phraseological expressions. And as the uh, words that we analyze, the vocabulary that we analyze in the dictionary comes from 16th century text. So each entry is illustrated by authentic examples coming from those 16th century texts. Now, um, because the third version of the online dictionary is quite difficult to prepare and quite time consuming so not all entries are very available right now what you have is letters a through n and the letter r and of course uh, we are working on it and entries beginning with n through p which are for now marked in black in the index should be available by 2024. Um, now work is in progress in the paper edition for the letters s through z and those entries are digitalized as we go. So as soon as an entry is prepared, it's also being digitalized so that the dictionary in the end can be complete. Um, as the dictionary is uh, based on 16th century texts, so those texts themselves can be accessed in the electronic database, which makes it possible for researchers and for all those interested to actually look at the entire text and not the uh, small fragments that you have available in the dictionary and in the cards. The database includes texts transliterated in Polish, so they're easier to read. As you can see, the original ones uh, were written in what we call Sprabacha, or the special Germanic font, so maybe a little less accessible to those who are not historians of language, and this is why a modern version is available where those texts have been transliterated. So you, all, all you have to do is click on texts on the left, and then a list of texts appears, and among these texts you have, for example, Wyprawa Królewne, so the text that Dr. Ewa Cybulska Bohusiewicz was talking about in her Polish Finnish project um, a few weeks ago. Um, and so each of these texts transliterated can be accessed through this data database. The dictionary has been prepared according to some modern standards of presenting old language texts and also taking into consideration the specificity of 16th century Polish. So as far as technicality, technicalities go, um, the texts are available in the XML format, which is the commonly used one. They're using the TEIP5 subcode and Unicode coding. The texts, as I said, are being transliterated and we include all information or complete information on the sources, so not only the page by, but also the column and line or the verse. Um, if there's foreign language within the text, usually it's Latin, it's marked uh, with special fonts and the graphic elements are also specially marked. So this is what it looks like or what it looked like at the beginning in the 50s where the cards were prepared. This is what it looks like when you're editing. So the authors of the dictionary see it like this. Then you have what we call the kitchen in Polish language. So this is the XML coding. And the reader, the user of the dictionary online sees it in such a form. 
Now, towards the future, obviously, the dictionary has not been finished yet, so we have um, a number of future plans. The first one is obviously to complete the remaining entries beginning with N through P by the year 2024. Then we would also like to prepare the English version of the dictionary uh, internet site. For now, we're only thinking of preparing the menu so that at least menu is uh, available for the reader who can browse. Preparing the English versions of the actual definitions or Polish explanations of the historical dictionary is a little bit more complicated. Now, we are constantly working on the remaining entries, so editing the S to Z, so Z with the diacritic sign entries. We're planning to expand the database as new text, new uses, new entries are still being analyzed, so the, the database should at least be doubled in size. And we're trying to annotate the words with grammar information that will make it easier than for the users to browse and to find what they're looking for. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ola. Now I will try to show this live on our site. Okay, uh, one moment. Okay, it's our site as you can see, only in Polish now, but I hope uh, until the next year, uh, no, <laughs> uh, until the year 2022, it will be, uh, you can use this in English. And the first one is dictionary. Oh, come on. Okay, so index. Uh, as I wrote and Ola said, uh, you can use uh, index to see, to find uh, the word. And in black, we uh, have entries which are not uh, prepared yet, so we, can, we can't go there, but we can go when the entry is green. Uh, this is the entry minister about which we called, and Eva said that this uh, not <laughs> term. <laughs> and we can see we have almost uh, over a hundred um, a hundred times used in our canon, and we can see uh, all. Uh, entry and you can see that over Pismach Katolików, uh, in Catholic's uh, writings, uh, you know that there's somebody who is very bad <laughs> and we have 71. So almost half of that, no, over half of that uh, is not good term. Uh, so this is the first part, dictionary and other part is the code. As Ola said, you can use uh, the menu on the right, on the left side, and choose the text. Uh, what about the Prawa Królewne? And we can see all text in transliteration as we use in our dictionary. And so we can read uh, all the personal belongings which took uh, Queen Catherine when she went to Finland. Uh, and now uh, that's all, but uh, I think uh, we can use the corp. Okay. Uh, maybe it's no. I think uh, that's all. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Patricia. This was really fascinating, and I think that this tool is very useful and helpful to to all of us. So thanks for presenting it at this phase. 
And uh, I'm sure that there are many uh, questions or comments. To Patricia's presentation. Always when you have problems with old Polish, I invite you to contact us mm -hmm. uh, by mail, by Eva, <laughs> <laughs> other way. Well, it's really kind. <laughs> yeah. We would like to help. Yeah, but but is is that an open access? Yes, yes. everything. Yeah. everything you don't open. need to log in or anything like that. No, 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 no. So it's easy to to use then. Yeah. Have you already used it? I think our Polish colleagues certainly know know the dictionary already. Yeah, and it works well. Not always the the electronic version because i know every everybody knows in poland knows uh, the book but not everybody uh, used to use electronic version but you you see it it's developing all the time mm -hmm. yeah but it, it looks really fantastic to me i have used that atilf in uh, ancient and uh, and old french and also as AOB, the, the dictionary for, for, for Swedish. Yeah, it, it's also an online dictionary and it's really helpful if, if you need help in, in Swedish language. But any other questions or remarks to Patricia? I can add uh, it's long term project, so yeah. mm -hmm. so I think it uh, would take mm, ten or fifteen years to uh, to the end. But yeah, but but it's it's monumental, <laughs> as, yeah, as your yeah. title tells. <laughs> it's sad, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> too monumental i think uh, yeah for sure but but yeah i really appreciate that that you people you are you are able to do it and you are funded for that as well yeah. <laughs> more or less I, I would like also say something that patricia was uh, a manager of a great project uh, to prepare electronic version of our dictionary very good but if there are no other comments or questions, I suggest that we shall move on. But uh, is Professor Heberek with us or not yet? Not yet, unfortunately. So, well, perhaps we, we could switch. Peter, 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 are you, are you ready to, to, to replace? Of course, uh, of course. Very good. Yeah, so, yeah. So we will we will uh, hear Darius uh, Hemperet's uh, presentation later on. Uh, so Peter will uh, talk about yeah. traveling books, literary spoils of war from Poland and Sweden and beyond. So please, the floor is yours. Peter. Thank you. And I guess you all see my screen. Yes, we do. Yeah, that's good. And as you can see, I've added a parenthesis around the title here, and that <laughs> means more or less that that this uh, subject actually is quite um, obsolete for my perspective uh, for an article. But I'm I'm working with this uh, subject and these questions all the time. So so in one way or another, um, it will still be relevant. But the title is 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 not going to be used any longer. I guess several of you have already been to, to Uppsala, uh, but for those of you who don't, uh, so who have not been there, um, as you know, the university was uh, founded in 1477. It was closed uh, during the majority of the uh, 15th, 16th right, century. And, oh, now someone is coming. 
Uh, Professor okay. Dariusz Hemperek is already with us, but continue, uh, Peter, please. Yes, yes. And then uh, will be uh, Dariusz. Yeah. Okay. 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 So uh, the university at Uppsala was closed during the more or less the entire um, 16th century. And then uh, it was reopened at the end of that century again. And in the 1620s, there was a big um, impetus coming to the university from Gustavus II Adolphus, who really wanted to create a, a, a better education in, in Sweden. And uh, from that period, we have this wonderful building at Uppsala, Gustavianum, uh, right next to the cathedral. It was the first uh, university building that is still extant. Uh, it was built in the 1620s. And at the same time, uh, the university library at Uppsala was founded. Uh, actually, it was founded. It has two dates of, of when it was founded. It was founded in... Um, by two different uh, decrees of the king from the 16 from 1620 and 1621 so actually this year and the next we are celebrating uh, 400 years uh, at my library uh, there was planned a big anniversary and a big uh, celebration and you know with a lot of activities but more or less everything has been cancelled due to to corona the corona situation uh, Yes, and and when the university library was uh, founded in uh, 1620, 21, uh, the university also received a book donation from uh, the Swedish king. Uh, and that was the books that had been confiscated from Swedish monasteries and also from some Swedish noble families and also from Sigismund. Uh, so some of the books that were once owned by um, uh, King Sigismund of Sweden and Sigismund III of, of Poland uh, has been at Uppsala since then. And Otto Walde treated that in, a, in an article from 1915 um, and, and could really uh, prove that, that they had been uh, at Uppsala um, all the time since then, and I, and as I said before, I I have been lucky enough to to catalog some of them myself. Uh, it's quite it's quite uh, marvelous to to sit with these items uh, in your own hands at your work and getting paid for it. It's it's magnificent actually. Um, so uh, and the, so there was a big book donation from from the Swedish king. Uh, but nevertheless, the university didn't have very many books, but that situation changed uh, quite rapidly because, as you know, Sweden was involved in several wars uh, in the 1620s uh, against Poland first, and then the Sweden also entered the Thirty Years' War. So uh, the Swedish armies took some sports of war from Braniewo and Frondborg in, in Poland. Uh, and, and later on from some German cities. In 1621, uh, the Swede Sweden confiscated the Jesuit College Library of Riga in Latvia. Uh, at the end of the century, the Jesuit College and, and some books from some other religious institutions in Poznan uh, were donated by the Swedish Crown to Uppsala University Library. And because of that, we have uh, several um, Polish collections still uh, today at, at Uppsala. Um, the thing is that the, the, the collections from Braniewo and Fromborg, they were donated to <coughs> Uppsala from the Swedish crown in 1627. And about that time, the first university library building was uh, built as well. And there is no extant picture of this um, what it, of this building. We don't exactly know what it looked like. Only this simple uh, drawing from the end of the century. Um, so what we can see about that building is that it consisted of, of two floors and, and held 
uh, three rooms on every floor. Uh, and I have myself treated this library building actually in several articles by, by now, because we have some catalog, uh, catalogs from uh, 1638 to 41. Um, 10 years um, after the first Polish collections arrived at Uppsala. And in these catalogs, we can see exactly how, how uh, the books that arrived were treated and received uh, when they came to, to Uppsala. And uh, I will show you, I have, yeah, I have listed some, some of my publications uh, concerning Polish and um, war booty uh, material at Uppsala. Uh, some are in Swedish and some in, in English. And I have still um, two more articles um, under publication. Um, and I have focused very much on, on actually this, this very basic thing. Uh, what does it mean that a uh, a university uh, in a Lutheran country where almost all clergymen and also the servants uh, to the state are, are educated. And what does it mean to receive a so big um, Catholic uh, religious institutions, their libraries? Uh, and, and yeah, because there is, a, there is an obvious conflict there and, and um, this is also very easily seen in the first uh, university library building. Uh, what I claim is, is that um, the upper floor of this uh, first university library building held the, the um, uh, books, I mean, the real university library, the books that were supposed to be used uh, in the present day uh, um, education and research while the, the lower floor was more of a storage room for the kind of literature that was not really um, meant to be used to the same extent. And in that lower floor, much of the Catholic books uh, were actually located. I mean, you could not um, let students read the, the Catholic books if you, if you were afraid of letting them become Catholic. Uh, it, it's obvious. and and. This can be seen uh, quite clearly in, in the, catalog, the first catalogs and also in some other contemporary sources. Um, so that is what I have been writing about from a book historical and, and uh, yeah, book historical and library historical perspective. As a librarian, I have also been involved in, in some um, projects that, that try to reconstruct the, the historical collection from Poland and at Uppsala. As you might have uh, seen already, uh, there was a publication in 2007 by Josef Tripuczko. He was a professor of Polish here at Uppsala and he worked for a long time on this catalog um, of the book collection of the Jesuit college. Um, the books that are still at Uppsala today uh, are, are presented in, in this uh, publication. And uh, the, the records in, in this catalog uh, can also be found in our national, national Union catalog, Libris. And uh, we have also digitized the, the book. So it's, it's available online for free if you are interested. And, and Presently, we are actually um, working on two different projects that aim at um, reconstructing two of the other literary uh, spoils of war from Poland and uh, not from Poland, from Latvia and Poland. The first is a, a, a project that aims at, at um, reconstructing the Jesuit College Library of Riga. This catalog will be, be uh, finished uh, at the beginning of next year in, in January. Uh, actually, it's, it's very close now. Uh, and uh, in January, we will also start working on a bigger project that aims at reconstructing the, the literary war booty from, from Poznan in col collaboration with the University Library in Poznan. 
so and and for this uh, conference actually and for the for the publication that we are preparing uh, in this uh, in this uh, connected to this workshop uh, i i i hesitate a bit um, about what to write about but i i have more more and more bit been uh, considering to to see um, if it's possible to trace uh, and and to analyze how the the books of um, the Swedish King Sigismund were were treated uh, in the Uppsala Library in the 17th century. I know this is quite close to what Susanna is doing, and I don't want to compete <laughs> with her. But but if it's possible to to have different angles on a similar material, that would be that would be lovely. I think because it's um, yeah, there are a lot of, of registers and catalogs from the 17th century uh, library that can be really useful in this in this uh, matter. And uh, I have also in one article uh, treated the, the, the fact that, that <coughs> so many of the, the books that were taken uh, as looted books from from Poland and other countries have been sold from the library over the ages. Um, at duplicate auctions. Uh, I mean, we had a Uppsala was a, a Lutheran university and quite soon received big um, collections, book collections from several Jesuit colleges. And several of the titles in these college uh, collections were more or less the same. So, um, I mean, they were hardly useful at the Lutheran university to start with. Um, so many of them were sold, and I guess that that also happened to some of the books of, of uh, Sigismund. Um, I don't know any exact number, but that is also possible to, it's possible to in investigate since the, the auctions catalog are still um, extant, uh, many of them. Um, yeah. That's the university library building once more. Um, and and uh, this is what I've been doing so far. I actually, I, I think I, I stop here. Um, uh, that might be a bit short, but since we are a bit late anyhow, I think that it could be worthwhile to to uh, draw a line there. I can just show you the the um, uh, one example of the books from from King Sigismund that I once cataloged. Um, this one has a very nice book binding. So it has been separated from our general collections and included in a, been included in a, in a collection on, on book bindings from different countries and, and uh, centuries. Um, as you can see, uh, uh, you can see the Ex Libris Serenissimi Regis Sigismundi under the, the printer's mark uh, there. Um, and as I mentioned, there is this, this uh, uh, excellent actually book uh, article by Otto Walde from 1915 in which he really um, proves that, that um, parts of the material were, was, um, was always uh, in, in Sweden and donated to Uppsala in the 1620s. So I think there is a good starting point with that article and also, um, yeah, with the first registers and, and, uh, and catalogs. Yeah. So questions, please, of all kinds. I will stop sharing my screen now. Um, Thank you, Peter. And as you can guess, I... <laughs> Found also this topic fascinating. I oh, hope that's you lovely. Hear. Yeah, <laughs> oh, you have it on my desk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. That's good. Yeah, yeah. And uh, please don't be afraid with uh, any kind of ideas to compete with me, that's good, as, as that's you good. said. That yeah. there could be different angles, and we can yeah. certainly do some cooperation. Exactly. And moreover, our project will end next summer. And I am ah. very much afraid that yeah. I am not able to finish my work okay. because of the epidemics. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I, I, I think that it, it, it's.
to you to yeah. to to, to <laughs> the work because you are there all the time and and you have access yeah yeah that, yeah you're but, right but, yeah. but i hope that i can i can do at least something of, of yeah, that yeah. And, and then i'm looking forward to to your work yeah and 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 i would be very happy to cooperate as well of course because i'm i'm really you know this is uh, for me. This will be uh, like a side project and mm. a very fascinating and, and tempting yeah. one, of course. But for yeah. me, it, it, I mean, according to how uh, Otto Walde discusses it in this article, he he really claims that this uh, collection of of Sigismund could rightly be be labeled as a war booty as well, since I mean, it was Sigismund's books, but once he was dethroned, they were confiscated by the crown. In a similar way as as how they you know treat the other collections, so it goes yeah. quite well into my my other in research interests as well, of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think I I will come back to this, but 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 I won't uh, privilege my position as a chair too much. So <laughs> no, if there are any other yeah. questions or comments, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay, Eva. I would like to ask you a question, Pieter. Yeah. <laughs> Pietro. Uh, if you are uh, involved in a um, project um, implemented by Poznan Library. Yeah. Oh, it's great. It's yeah, great. Yeah, actually, the, 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 the Poznan project that we have, we have. Uh, been have had we have had some prelim, preliminary work uh, going on for some years now but now in january we will start for real here in in Uppsala. and so so you probably know several of them rafao yes uh, mm -hmm. and renata mm -hmm. alicia jakub well I, I i cannot pronounce their second names unfortunately but mm -hmm. uh, but uh, they are very nice all of them and and yeah we look forward to to working together with them for several years now. So, um, and I, I have also been invited to go to Poznan uh, on, a, on a research stay for two weeks by, by Rafał. Unfortunately, now in, that we have this Corona situation, I don't know when it will, will be possible, but yeah. I mean, we have a, we have a, a lot of um, Polish material at Uppsala and, and uh, I find this uh, honestly. I'm, I'm not saying that because there are so many Polish people here now, but I'm, I really think it's one of the most interesting that we have. Uh, and and uh, I mean, we have been working with the the material uh, for for such a long time and trying to to make give access and to to digitize as much as we can. We have digitized several library catalogs, for instance. Uh, of the Jesuit College of Branjevo, of the Jesuit Colleges of, of Poznan, and we had digitized the entire Copernicana collections. I once cataloged it myself, actually, as well. Uh, and, uh, and now we have this project with Riga. Uh, yeah, I, I, I find this so rewarding to discuss this material from so many, many perspectives. So, yeah. Yeah, it's good advertisement. <laughs> thank you thank you thank you <laughs> yeah and are there any other questions or comments to peter joanna please yes um i uh, polish books in yeah. in sala yeah how well researched are they i'm just thinking like is it possible that there might be some of Vituski's books there. Because the thing with Kukluster Library mm. is that mm. um, when Wrangel died, his yeah. collection was divided into four <laughs> parts, mm -hmm. which were passed on his uh, daughters. And, mm. you know, daughters married and they brought the books with them. Yeah. So basically only about one fourth of his books were mm. left. Uh, at school cluster so technically it could be that some of Vituski's books especially the more you know uh, yeah. with elaborate bindings and so on but they mm. ended up somewhere else in Sweden yeah yeah um to be to be honest I'm I'm not sure I haven't I haven't seen the um, his his name among the books and and I'm I am not sure actually because the books that were taken uh, during the the deluge in the 1650s uh, to a, a rather limited extent, they came to Uppsala. It was more or less the books from Poznan. Mm -hmm. and they came via this, this nobleman, Klaus Roland, mm -hmm. uh, his library in the 1690s, when it was donated by the crown. Uh, but 
so so but most books uh, i mean for instance from the from the royal castle in in warsaw and so on uh, they they didn't come to Uppsala, but they they came to other swedish library libraries uh, so i wouldn't i mean several centuries have passed since then and things book have arrived later to our library as well so it could be possible but i i cannot guarantee it and i'm not sure yeah but has has every book in the collection been examined when it comes to provenances or is it still work to be done uh, it's absolutely work to be done i mean work we have so okay. big yeah uh, it's it's a very good question actually because and this is really a a bit it, if you're both a librarian and a researcher it's, it's a bit tragic because we have huge collections of early printed books and i mean they have all most of them have been cataloged but not in online catalogs no uh, they I are still noticed these, that. <laughs> yeah you have noticed more than many <laughs> yeah. other yeah. i mean perhaps five percent of of our uh, early printed books have been uh, digitally cataloged uh, and the thing is, when the when when the old catalogs were were made, people were not interested to the same degree in provenances mm -hmm. and and you know the material evidence in the books. Yeah. So, oh, there is so much to be done. <laughs> yeah, I wish you can all could all come to Uppsala and work at at the library. I mean, yeah. yeah. It's also a very good gathering to see that there is a kind of book historical trend. Going yeah, on at the moment. absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. and also the book historical from from this really material perspective, yeah. uh, with with the copy specific information and so on, the, the context of each copy, so Indeed. to speak. Yeah. But if I can exploit <laughs> these um, this precious time to to ask a question about Otto Walde, yeah, um, whom I like very much. I think he has done the basic work. Yeah, it's it's it absolutely yeah. marvelous. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but there are some uh, new generation uh, researchers yeah. who have challenged his his thoughts. Perhaps yeah. you you know, for instance, Emma Hagström, yeah. yeah. and and her views about that uh, Lutheranism and and Catholicism, and and she. If, if I remember correctly, she explained that the, that the division is is not the confession, but but what, what do you think about that? Well, in, I, I don't. I agree mean, with, in books. I don't agree with her uh, at all. Actually, uh, I don't want to. Uh, I know her very well, and I yeah, like yeah, her, so yeah. I don't want to be. Circle, circles be too, are small. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. want to. I don't want to be too brutal, but mm. uh, I I think it's. I. If you think about it from a Swedish perspective, in the Sweden in the in the early 17th century, mm -hmm. it was extremely hostile to yeah, Catholicism. I, yeah, I, I mean, it, I mean, it was so. So I mean, and um, I've actually written an article that will be published now uh, any week now in Swedish. I will be happy to send it to you when yes. I have, uh, have okay. I have been studying some some dissertations from Uppsala University. Uh, from the, um, I mean, and this uh, this is my my main point of this article that that is that when when the the books from Branjevo and Thromborg arrived at Uppsala, uh, they the, the Swedish Lutherans and the professor of theological polemics uh, suddenly received so many Catholic books uh, that he could uh, use uh, Catholic arguments uh you know to, to to argue against the catholic arguments in a, in a quite new way because he had the modern literature and what what happened was that uh, immediately after that there was a series of dissertations in in theology at Uppsala, which treated uh, how how dangerous the pope is and his uh, his uh, doctrine and uh <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah yeah but really really hostile and i mean it sounds horrible to say it today but at this time the the, the pope is antichrist in these uh, uh dissertations and the jesuits are are like his his evil followers and so on it's extremely hostile to catholicism and i mean if you have this in in the in the university environment at the time uh, it of course, this is reflected also in how they they arrange their library. Um, so, I, that, and I, I claim that very strongly, actually, because yeah, yeah. it's yeah, 
I think we tend to tend to underestimate the the importance of the religious yeah. argumentation at the time. Yeah, yeah. Nowadays, actually. Absolutely, I agree with you, but I just wanted to hear your opinion yeah. because it, I was really astonished when when I read read her her article about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so I don't I don't uh, I don't agree with her, and and I don't know if you have seen my my. Um, the, my article in in the Journal of Jesuit Studies, um, I, I could send it to you if you're interested because I, yeah. I, this is actually the the main, yeah. I try to, to argue for okay. this thing. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, and you have developed it in in that article, so I can read it from there. Yes, and and, and also so in please, the please the one that all, all your articles you. <laughs> you. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah. the same to you, of course. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. But I think that we should move on. Yeah. Unfortunately, we could continue this yes, discussion yes, on and on. But uh, the next speaker is finally Darius Heberek. Mm. And uh, he will speak about a new source for research on the life and legion of Anna Vazovna, funeral carmen to the death of Anne of the Swedish princess by uh, Vavrij Vavrijinjec Hlebovsky. Laurentius. Laurentius, yes. yes, thank you, that's easier. So please. Yes. Um, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to share with my uh, researches uh, about Anna, um, uh, Princess Anna Vasa. Uh, my speech uh, will contain of three parts. Uh, the first one uh, will be a brief portrait of Anna of uh, Anna Vasa. Uh, of course, you know uh, her excellent. So that's why it will be brief. In brief, uh, the second part. Uh, <clears throat> maybe much more interesting for you uh, will be about uh, Anna Vaza's uh, patronage uh, <clears throat> for scientists, for, for uh, uh, poets. And the third one, my small uh, contribution to the uh, researching uh, 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 about um, Anna Vaza. So first of all, mm, this uh, brief portrait of, of the princess. Uh, as we know, she was born in 1568 uh, in Sweden. She died uh, 1625 uh, in, in uh, Poland, in um, Brodnica, uh, almost 30, um, 31 or 32 years she lived in uh, uh, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Um, she came to Poland uh, three times. The first one was in uh, 1587 and uh, uh, on the coronation of her brother, Zygmunt III. And uh, in that moment, uh, uh, we have uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, sentences, some, some uh, characteristic of her by uh, Anibal from Capua, a uh, nuncio or, or papal nuncio, that time uh, that uh, he states that Anna is cunning and prudent person. And uh, uh, the second uh, uh, station, she has a better, she has better head than her brother. Uh, uh, the third, uh, the, th the second uh, coming uh, uh, was in uh, 1591 until 1593. Also two years, and the third uh, coming to Poland in uh, 1589 uh, uh, after the Battle of Linkoping, we know. So uh, she was given a starostvo, a district of Brodnica in 1605 by her brother, and uh, six years uh, later, a district of Golub. Uh, and uh, so all two districts were quite rich, uh, dozens of uh, villages, uh, mills, ponds, and so on and so on. So she was a quite wealthy woman at that time. And uh, we know she was never married. Uh, uh, her matching up with uh, John Georg uh, Gregor uh, Hohenzollern took for many years without success, as we know. And uh, 
what to do to this, what to add to do to this uh, brief portrait, that she was really one of the most out, outstanding women that time. Uh, not because of fact that he was an uh, uh, ardent Lutheran, uh, in the same time as we know, Sigmund III was an ardent Catholic. It happened that time, we know, not very rarely. For instance, uh, uh, the great counselor of uh, Polish Lithuanian, uh, uh, the great counselor of uh, Poland, Jan Zamoyski's. Uh, sister was Calvinist and he was Catholic, for instance. Uh, so it happened. And, but it is sure for us that uh, she uh, uh, had a great friendship with her brother and uh, the, uh, the relationship between them were really very closely, as well as with her nephew, Władysław IV. And it is important that uh, from this point of view that when she died in uh, 1625, her, um, uh, her death was, uh, let's say, a kind of scandal. Uh, so uh, uh, because of some, some plots uh, uh, made by Jesuits at that time, that she converted on the deathbed into Catholicism. Uh, uh, it was abolished by her nephew, uh, uh, Władysław IV, and he made the official uh, uh, funeral for her in uh, uh, 1636. Uh, uh, and it was, I must, um, I must, uh, uh, I must emphasize that this uh, moment, Toruń, 1636, uh, the funeral of Anna Vasa, was the, perhaps the great, the last great manifestation of power of uh, uh, Protestantism in Poland, because uh, uh, um, uh, the participants of this funeral were uh, from the best. Polish families, uh, Polish and Lithuanian families at that time, I mean Radziwills, I mean Denhoffs, I mean Leszczyński, I mean Ray, uh, Ostrorok, and so on. So let's go to the second part, uh, Princess Anna Vaza's patronage. And uh, she was not uh, very much involved uh, into uh, politics but she was really a great supporter of uh, science uh, and art. And uh, let's, let's divide uh, his, her activity into uh, uh, three fields. The third field is uh, supporting of uh, science and scientists. Perhaps all we know that she supported edition of Herbarium Zielnik by Serenius. And uh, we may uh, understand uh, this effort uh, knowing that Serenius uh, uh, Herbarium was perhaps the biggest uh, ever printed book in Poland until the end of 18th century. Uh, it has uh, 1,600 pages in folio, uh, 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 printed in, uh, uh, most of them printed in small font. And of course, uh, with, uh, of course, with uh, 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 drawings of plants, herbs, and so on. The second, uh, so uh, it was done in 1613, uh, uh, and he, she also supported to, uh, to Gabriel Ioannice, uh, to Gabriel Ioannice, a friend of Serenius, and she also uh, 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 support, financially supported his smaller, much smaller herbarium uh, about plants uh, around Krakow. Yes, uh, she also had very good contacts with uh, theologists. So, uh, first of all, I would like to say about uh, Samuel Dambrowski, who created his great uh, 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 book, Postilla, also a very huge one, and dedicated it to 
um, to Anna Vaza. It is worth mentioning that, that Dambrowski's Postilla uh, uh, is, let's say, a um, long seller. It was used by Lutheran people until the half of 20th century. So uh, very, and we are sure that, that she, uh, Anna Vaza, supported this, this the printing this book. Um, the second, uh, the second interesting person is Daniel Kramer, known uh, by humanists uh, from his Emblemata Sacra, but he was also a theologian, and he dedicated to Anna Vaza uh, uh, his Bible, not his generally, it was a Bible translated by, by Luther, but he dedicated uh, uh, to Anna Vaza uh, this, this uh, book. Uh, also, let's uh, uh, mention about uh, Jan Turnowski, a theologian uh, from another side. I mean, he was a Czech brother who lived in Poland, also quite eminent person at that time, an author of psalms, of uh, songs and of uh, treatises. Uh, and uh, last but not least, Valerius Herberger from Schowa, Great Poland. Uh, known as Small Luther. Uh, he was uh, a Lutheran pastor, Lutheran uh, a priest, and uh, we know that he dedicated uh, to Anna Vaza Florilegium Paradiso uh, Psalmorum in 1625. Uh, so, uh, the, the next uh, cycle is uh, uh, our poets who dedicated her some uh, uh, poems. And we may see that she was quite tolerant person. I mean, there are many confessions among them. For instance, Jan Rybinski was Czech brethren who dedicated a uh, um, welcoming poet to Anna Vaza in, 19, in uh, 1591. Uh, Stanisław Grochowski was a Catholic. Jan Alhacyk Mita was Catholic. Andrzej Zbelitowski, uh, perhaps the best of them, uh, was also Catholic. Uh, what I'd like to add that uh, 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 the names of um, eminent writers appeared also during her uh, official funeral in Torun in 1636. Uh, it's, it's important that uh, one of speakers were Martin Opitz, called the father of uh, German language that time. And that uh, that time he uh, Opitz was a secretary of uh, uh, Władysław Vasa the Fourth, and Princess Anna Vasa uh, was himself a writer. Exactly, I mean, uh, uh, epistolographer. Uh, we have uh, still preserved our three hundred letters uh, uh, written. Mm, to many important persons, for instance, uh, Hetman Jan Karol Chodkiewicz and his wife, also from Lithuania, Leo Sapiecha and his uh, uh, wife, uh, Anna Radziwiu, uh, uh, also from Lithuania, or, for instance, uh, Ursula uh, Meyelin, who was Majordomus of uh, uh, the court of uh, Zygmunt III. So, so she was really an uh, interesting person as a, a patron of uh, this science, uh, of scientists and uh, poets. We know that uh, she uh, wrote also letters to them, for instance, to Valerius Herberger, uh, this small Luther from, from Schowa. Uh, so let's go to the third part of my uh, uh, of, of, of this speech. Mm. Uh, the peak of, in, of uh, scientific interest uh, of um, uh, connected with uh, Anna uh, Vaza uh, was 90s. I mean, uh, it was 
it, uh, it was because of archaeological excavations in Torun, in her thumb, in her sarcophag, uh, and uh, a lot of uh, attention was paid to uh, things like her clothes, her jewelry, her, uh, her health, uh, and so on and so on. For instance, uh, archaeologists and anthropologists discovered that uh, she was really ill uh, last uh, in in twenties. Uh, she had uh, advanced scoliosis and so on. But uh, uh, rem but there are so so we have two books from nineties which uh, are. Uh, uh, witness of the, which shows their interest. For instance, Grażyna Kurkowska, Anna Wazówna. It is a small book, uh, uh, quite popular one. Uh, much more interesting is a book by Alicja Sarkozłowska, uh, Infantka Szwecji i Polski, Anna Wazówna, Legenda i Rzeczywistość, Legend and Reality. But um, what, what I want to express is that uh, most of uh, articles and uh, um, uh, these books are based on her, let's say, post-funeral uh, post uh, history. I mean, collected with history of art uh, and so on. And I'm interested mostly uh, with um, Anna Vaza as a, as a a patron of, of scientists and artists, artists. and uh, some uh, uh, months ago I have found a, a not explored a poem by Wawrzyniec Chlebowski, Laurentius Chlebowski, uh, 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 written in 1625, and this funeral kamena is, of course, a, a, a poem prepared to be printed because of her funeral, but um, it stayed in manuscript only. This manuscript is now preserved in Ossolineum in uh, Wrocław, in the uh, library there. And what is interesting that uh, uh, Chlebowski uh, uh, shows us um, some new perspectives uh, uh, on, on Anna um, Vazovna. Of course, this uh, poem is not uh, uh, very important from artistic point of view. Lebowski was not a master of poetry, but uh, it seems he was a well-informed person about uh, Anna Vazovna and uh, her court. But let's start from, I will present you uh, uh, three quotations from uh, his uh, poem. Uh, in, the, in preface, in the preface uh, he wrote uh, such a sentence. Anna, Princess Anna exchanged the earthy crown to the celestial one because her temporal life converted to the eternal kingdom so we shall not grieve or worry, and indeed this transition and trade and the trade is a glorious event. Uh, it seems for us uh, quite normal, but um, uh, for instance, what what Peter was saying uh, before, it was a time of a battle between between Catholics and, and Protestants, battle or, or for, for souls, yes? And such sentence that uh, Anna is going to heaven after her death, written by Catholic poet, may cause that this poem was not uh, printed, yes? And, uh, in the end of this uh, uh, quite uh, big poem, uh, uh, it's uh, part, uh, the part titled Laments of Anna Vaza. Uh, Anna Vaza is saying uh, uh, his, uh, uh, his farewell to some persons. Of course, he's saying farewell to his brother, uh, more surprisingly uh, to Bishop Szyszkowski, Catholic Bishop of Krakow, 
But he says also far away to uh, uh, Ursula Mayelin, this uh, 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 majordomus of, of Vaza family at that time. So it seems that, that Chlebowski knew about, about uh, uh, her relationships. Uh, and what else? We see some, we see some other uh, interesting uh, things. Let me let me uh, 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 um, let me read. Uh, Dear Maciej Niemoyevski, Castellan of Helm, thank you for your virtuous service. I felt kidne- kindness in your service. I felt stateliness and truthfulness. After your loyal service, farewell, Maciej. And I also part with you, Wapinski Andrzej whose virtues were shown, were shown to us and to whom every, every, uh, every order was much more than duty. Why it is this important? We know some uh, names, uh, people who were in the court of Anna Vazówna in uh, Brodnica and Golub. Mainly, uh, they are uh, uh, they are names of uh, Swedish emigrants. Some of them are Polish. I'm, I, for instance, uh, a teacher of uh, uh, Frau Zimmer uh, was Polish uh, uh, minister. I mean, uh, a priest, a Lutheran priest. Babski was was from Poland, but main, mainly they are Swedish. And now um, appears two uh, Polish names. I mean uh, Andrzej Wapiński and Maciej Niemoyevski. So uh, uh, I may tell only, only about uh, Maciej Niemoyevski that uh, now. Um, perhaps uh, uh, it it can be that that Chlebowski changed the uh, first name of Niemoyevski because we know for sure that uh, Stanisław Niemoyevski helped uh, um, Anna Vazówna to uh, sell her jewelry in Moscow. Niemoyevski went to Moscow on the wedding of uh, Maryna Mishówna and Tsar Dmitry I and uh, with a, a, a famous uh, green box of jewelry. Uh, fortunately, uh, during these bad times in Russia, uh, uh, this jewelry were sent after some years to Poland back. Uh, but maybe uh, there is another uh, uh, Niemoyevski, Maciej, uh, I, I must investigate uh, more. And the third, uh, the second name, this Andrzej Wapinski, I know there was uh, such a um, uh, noble family in Lithuania. So uh, the work is in progress. So, so that's all from me. Thank you very much for your attention. And please, uh, I will be grateful for uh, questions. Many thanks, Dariusz Hemperek. It was really interesting once again. And, and I know that many of us are fascinated by, by Anna Vazas or Anna Vazuna's uh, personality and, and activities. So I'm sure that there are comments and questions related to that. I have been once in Torun and, and I visited her tomb, of course. Of course, it, it wasn't so magnificent as, as I thought, but touching in a way. Yeah. In that St. Saint, Saint Mary's church. Yeah. yeah. So please. I would like to ask Darius uh, about uh, this text is uh, original or it's a compilation? Uh, by Klebowski? Yes. Uh, it seems to me that this text is original. I mean that that uh, I know what do you mean uh, uh, that Klebowski uh, uh, um, uh, uh, is considered as a fifth <laughs> in literature, but uh, I didn't found anything uh, wrong. I mean, I didn't found anything written from somebody else um, from the first glimpse. Uh, so 
I, I guess uh, the text of Lebowski is original. Of course, thank you. Any other comments or questions? On Anna Vasa. It seems that there is a lot of material to be studied still. I know only that um, there is that small edition of, of her letters. 20 letters. Um, yeah, yeah, only. And, and you mentioned that there are uh, 300. 300, yes. And he sent and he sent this letter to really many persons, not only mm. to big families, and uh, uh, mm. I must emphasize that not only to, to Protestant people like Rajivils or or mm. uh, or or, mm. uh, or, or Urs Ursula Meilin, Meilin, uh, but also to um, to Catholics, to to uh, Hotkiewicz, to to Sapieha. Um, um, she was very helpful to ordinary people. There are letters who sent, in particular, first to Gdańsk, to Toruń, please help to this widow, please help to this old soldier, and so on and so on. So, yeah. so also, also, and also. Yeah, her mother did the same, yeah. same thing. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, Eva. Uh, I would be very grateful for, for information from you about uh, what is known about Anavasa in Finland and in Sweden. And I would be very happy uh, uh, having information from you about, about bi 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 bibliography or, uh, about her. Yeah, not, not very much as far as I know, uh, but there are some mentions. For instance, I, I found a mention about her in Södermanland's uh, history or chronicle and where it was said that uh, he, uh, and her that her writing style was a man's style that he was a kind of a boyish girl uh -huh, <laughs> uh -huh. I don't know uh -huh. if it's any any um, you know uh, if it's based on reality or on some stories or accounts yes 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 yeah. it is mentioned not only once that mm -hmm. uh, his uh, uh, but that her behavior mm. uh, was uh, uh, quite like men. Yeah, yeah, it's quite interesting. And also there is a kind of uh, commonplace to, to say that her impact on her brother was very big. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, uh, it's a pity not, not bigger because we know Sigmund III was very intolerant and uh, it is uh, quite funny that Sigmund III uh, uh, protected uh, intolerant behavior uh, uh, in towns, I mean tumults. And after this, uh, uh, Anna Vazovna sent money to those Protestants in Krakow, in Lublin, <laughs> to help them after tumults and so on. Yeah, but please, Eva. <laughs> I would like to ask if uh, the letters of Anna Vazovna are already published or not? Only a small part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, Jaroslav Dumanowski and Kraftruk and somebody else published 20 of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but the rest of them are in many libraries, in many archives. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the good... Uh, I mean, uh, the knowledge of, uh, I, I mean, that uh, Alicia Sarkozwowska uh, uh, knows uh, perhaps uh, is the best in this, uh, in, in this case. Mm -hmm. because I know, I know her publication about Anna very well. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So, so his, he uses uh, many of her letters. Yes, I saw the fragment of letters in yes, her yes, book yes. already. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Darius. Was really impressive. <laughs> oh yes, it is quite a rare situation for me to have uh, two speeches in one day on international oh. conference. <laughs> it was. <laughs> it went <laughs> <very> well. <laughs> 
as yeah. you know, as you know, the only listener to me the first time was Professor Mawek. <laughs> I don't know how it happened, but he he listened me to the end. Incredible, because Google server has <laughs> collapsed at all. No, not for me, not for not for Professor Mawek. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but incredible really <laughs> do we have any other comments or questions on this or okay we, we shall uh, continue uh the exchange after this workshop i i hope yeah, yeah. What... i will be very pleased thank you very much thanks but what do you think if we would we would make a pause of five minutes or something like that and continue after that. Would it be okay? How many? Uh, five papers minutes, do we... a couple of minutes. How many papers do we have to, to listen? Two. Only two. I see. Mm -hmm. okay. So are you ready to continue immediately? You are the boss. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> yes, want to be democrat I want to be democratic. <laughs> So I'm asking from you, do you have any opinions? Okay, but you're asking about uh, uh, some break, yes? Yes, but it's not necessary. I just thought that you may need it. I can continue. Okay, let's continue. Okay, okay. let's continue then. So our next speaker is Michal Puran, who will speak about occasional literature about the Smolensk victory of Vladislav the Fourth Vasa in 1634? A review. So please, floor is yours. Um, I correct this title. Uh, I take uh, some one elements, uh, and I will I, I will show you uh, this uh, new version. Uh, but I have to, I don't know where it's oh, yes. in this place, share. Share screen, yeah. Yes, great. I think that is great. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> during War of Smolensk in years 1632-1634, uh, uh, these are the the fourth Vaza on Louder, the... please. Louder, please. What happened, Darius? Yeah, okay. Okay. Okay, better. During War of Smolensk in year 1632-1634, Władysław the fourth Vaza unblocked the uh, siege of the fortress led by former Smolensk voivod uh, Michał Borisowicz Shane. Uh, I don't going to present the history of uh, relationship between Smolensk uh, about Smolensk uh, between uh, Commonwealth. Uh, and Moscow. Uh, I will uh, talking about uh, this etap uh, and uh, literature on this etap. Mm, the general uh, affiliation, as well as the time and place of publication and uh, environment uh, in which the texts were uh, created and important is uh, classifying the text. Uh, a wide uh, selection of re research material allows uh, us uh, to follow the uh, course of the reaction to the Smolensk victory by, uh, by what is of the fourth Vaza in the enter uh, literature. The subsequent stages uh, of the literary campaign accompanying uh, the war in the years 1632-1634 uh, are in fact analogical uh, to those uh, of the Smolensk war uh, in years uh, 16 uh, at 9-1611 or, or to the uh, struggle uh, with the Tur Turkish uh, at Kotin in 1621. 
those events were accompanied by, by propaganda and literary campaigns with specific dynamism. During them, a similar set of literary genres uh, was used, which emerged uh, from similar needs uh, the state by the uh, uh, circumstances and propaganda purpose. In the text attention in drawn by the very frequent uh, emphasis of the fact that the vasas are in uh, straight line uh, here and uh, continuous uh, of Jagiellonians. We remember that the uh, grandmother of Władysław IV, Vaza, and uh, the mother of his father, uh, Zygmunt the Third Vaza, were the uh, kings of uh, Sweden, Jan Third Vazas, wife Polish princess Katarzyna Jagiellonka. Władysław the fourth Vaza was uh, Verworf, a great uh, grandson of Zygmunt the Fourth, the old, and Queen Bona Sforza from the this staff side. Hence, it seems justified uh, to raise the smallest issue at the conference devoted to the Jagiellonians. The, the Vazas on the throne of the Commonwealth ensured uh, the long duration of the Jagiellonian dynasty. Only the end of the region uh, with the abdication of Jan, Ka Jan Kazimierz means the definitive end of the Jagiellonian ruling in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. For example, in the anonymous work the triumph and congratulations to the brightness and invisible Władysław IV, the phrase um, indicating uh, connections between the Vaza's uh, blood and the Jagiellonian's uppers twice. Next. Uh, Mm, the mm, memorable uh, foundation of the Jagiellonian house, Moscovian uh, side lets uh, fill in the need. The connection with Jagiellonians is also visible in the title of Wawrzyniec Śmieszkowicz's work written from the ceremony of King's coronation just before uh, his departure uh, to Smolensk. Uh, Leta Lechia et Vox Jagiellonia ad recens inauguratum Polonie Regem Vladislavum Sigismundum. Mm. Uh, or in the ending of another work of the same poet, uh, Xenium Votivum Regi Potestissimo Vladislao Moschorum. Uh, per duelium vindici felicissimo, uh, where we read, O magne Vladisla Jagiellonie, uh, Striumpsque Gloriaque Summa Gloria. Also, the first lines of the Epinikion written on the occasional occasion of the Vladislav uh, the fourth uh, coronation refer to the Jagiellonian tradition. Magne Jagiellonides, Lux Sarmatie Armi Potentis. At present, we will be interested in the text written according to the departure of the Royal Army to Smolensk, especially in those announced after the capitulation tribute which the Mo Moscow army paid during the march from Smolensk in front of the king on March 1633. Mm, the peace uh, finishing the war was singed on June 1634 beside Polanówka River. Mm, we will mainly deal with uh, prints and they should be a
compute uh, with wider uh, social impact and a more um, prestigious character as they were written and funded on demand on of municipal municipal and uh, religious uh, authorities and also dedicated to signif signified uh, patrons among the texts accompanying the departure to the world we find sermons vaticina and exhortations the course of the struggle is followed uh, by news and diaries uh, and uh, when the fight is is over the victorious uh, return to the country is accompanied uh, triumphs epinipiums songs congratulatory poems written in prose speeches and triumphant sermons it is worth not noticing uh, that the words works uh, commemorating the smallings victory uh, were part of the celebration celebrations orga, orga, organized uh, in the cities of the republic of poland they accompanied the ceremonial entries going for war occasional sermons vaticina and exhortations the example of an uh, occasional sermon uh, accompanying the king's departure to Smolensk is itinerarium uh, but, uh, itinerarium uh, of the trip to the moscow where uh, of the brightness and invisible Władysław the fourth by adam makowski examples of the Vaticinum uh, producing the uh, knight's victory are Andrzej of Konojat Dembowenski, the fortune teller of the Moscow battle, and Jan Cynerski Rachmatowicz Felix Omen. Examples of exhortations encouraging uh, the knights uh, to punish the Tsaris tops of breaking the uh, dueling truce are the handwritten works triumph um, triumph and congratulations to the most uh, brilliant and invasible Władysław the fall and so on uh, and votum uh, leaving for the Moscow expedition to the most uh, brilliant Wodysław the fourth. Next group. Proceeding of the struggle news and diaries. The news creates an informative relational statement in the smallest uh, extinct literary ensemble from uh, according um, to the press uh, politics information and reports from events. In two groups uh, can be distinguished, written in Polish, addressed to the recipient in the Republic of Poland and in for foreign uh, languages German, Italian, and speech address to the foreign recipient. News written, ah, excuse me, mm, news written in Polish. Some of them uh, were published several times in different places, Warsaw or Krakow, and so on. Uh, mm, as in the case of news from Moscow, briefly and generally uh, guided. Moreover, uh, were, there were uh, published news from Moscow or vota from trades and consults of the um, consum women of the Moscow land in the 
capital city. News of the languages, ah, it was. Uh, no, no, uh, German, Spain, Italian, and Latin um, were published in various uh, parts of Europe. For instance, Madrid, Malaga, Rome, Brussels, Gdańsk, and a few in German without uh, specifying the place of printing. The news uh, present the course of uh, event of the conditions uh, conditions on the uh, peace uh, concurred. Uh, uh, news uh, portrayed the processing of events or concurrences uh, of declared peace. And next. Mm, 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 News could have a form uh, of popular song, mm, a new song of or Moscow Triumph. Mm, Moscow Triumph and Rachtamowicz, Clemens Victoria. It was Uh, it was uh, enclosed with a poem addressed to the Krakow Academy and accepts from the uh, writings of Stanislav Orzechowski. Next. Mm, pieces accompanying the triumph, triumphant return to the country. Uh, triumphs, epinipiums, speech, songs, congratulatory works, in verse, written in prose and triumphant sermons. The next stage of development in the occasional literature devoted to the Smolensk victory were occasional triumphant works. On the occasion of the Smolensk victory, they were written by students and school teachers uh, for instance, Jesuit uh, colleges uh, such as uh, Lublin uh, College. Mm. It is a very interesting collection of poems uh, of various size with a scent of illustrations having an allegorical, allegorical uh, meaning. Daniel Otrembusch, next work, a teacher at the Nowodworski College in Krakow, where the, uh, the author of Panegyricus uh, Serenissimo, Serenissimo Ac Potentissimo Vladislao Quarto Polonia Specie Regi, etc. Uh, the work was uh, published uh, with, received, received by Valery Wilczogórski, a uh, poetic student. student. Triumph written by a lecture of Vilnius Academy as speech. Mm, triumph of prose works were uh, also written among universities in the Republic of Poland. For instance, uh, uh, for instance, the art of Panegyricus, Panegyricus at Potentissimum and so on. Uh, pricing speech, was Alexander Radoński lector for Vilnius Academy. Mm, an opinion uh, entitled uh, Happy Moscow Exp Expedition was written by, by Samuel Fardowski based, based on the uh, account of the report from the uh, proceeding of the fights. Form of prayer have songs of thank giving to God for the victories of Valusar IV uh, over Moscovian and Turk received in the year of our Lord 1634 on the third day of October. And written in prose speeches uh, Manubie. 
Ofian Leśniowski. Short congratulations to Johan Betem gratulatio. Quam ante biennum et hot excurit Wladislao Quarto in Polonie regem electo in eternitatis ede. The triumphant sermon was delivered by Jesuit Jakub Olszewski in Vilnius on March 1634 during the convocational session in the presence of senators. Senators, the triumph of generation convocate from Vilnius and so on. And next, occasional sermons delivered in the seats of the Republic of Poland. Uh, for instance, in Vilnius, the image of the royal shepherd in the person of the most uh, serene, Władysław IV, in Polish King, uh, Swedish Dominican, uh, Father Dominik Krasowski. The addresses of the dedication letters were authors of the Republic of Poland, such as Adam Kazanowski, Jakub Weyer, Nikolaj Kiszka, Wojewód of Mścisław. Uh, the addresses of the dedication could also be a large man, as in the case of Dominik Krasowski's sermon um, and Szymon Kłodziński, as in the case of the work Clemens Victoria Wladislaw Kwarto by Jan Cymerski Rachmatowicz. A significant role in the propaganda campaign was played by Thinking House of the Widow of John Rossowski, where they published news from Moscow briefly and generally collected and uh, the Happy Moscow Expedition by Samuel Fardowski. Though nothing uh, is diversity of the language of works, places of publication, general forms, the use of both poetry and prose, a large number of authors representing various circles and a large number of patrons. All this testifies to national nationwide rank of ceremonies to celebrate the victory of Władysław IV Vaza in Smolensk uh, and an attempt to make this event international. Thank you, uh, this one. Uh, thank you for your attention uh, and I'm sorry for my English. <laughs> No, you don't have to sorry about. Thank you very much. It was very understandable and and thanks for introducing us this rich material of which we are perhaps not so familiar with. And uh, all in all, uh, the figure of of Ladislaus or Ladislaus the fourth is not very well known in 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 Sweden and Finland at least as far as I know. So this is very useful. So, any comments or questions? Okay, while the others are, are thinking about their uh, comments, I exploit my position and, and ask the first one. You mentioned that uh, what was that? It, it was news in Polish language in the form yes, of, yes. of song. Since I have studied uh, medieval troubadours, so I'm quite interested in, in that because they also, they uh, mediated uh, news uh, during their presentations, both in, in form of, of prose and in, in lyrics, in, in music. So uh, do you have any, any uh, views? On that. It, it made uh, several forms uh, and prose and, uh, and poets' forms. 
it, it uh, print on the small uh, it, it a small forms uh, short uh, poems uh, or short uh, information mm -hmm. uh, print on the small one card or, or, or two card uh, card uh, and uh, sent uh, around mm. uh, yeah, yeah. Do you remember what was the subject of that specific song? Was was it about the the the, the battle? <laughs> mm, it, it's a uh, it's special specific is the uh, that uh, this information uh, uh, published uh, not only uh, uh, in Polish. Uh, it, pub it published in the in the uh, much city of Poland, Poznań, Warsaw, uh, Krakow, and uh, and uh, published uh, uh, and abroad, uh, the Rome, uh, in Spain, uh, and in, in the German. Ah, okay. It was spread really over the Europe. Yes, uh, yeah. much uh, place of of Europe. Uh, uh, and, and it's very in, uh, important informating about this uh, victory uh, what is the fourth uh, in the all Europe. It's a propaganda. It's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but is there any information uh, on the melody on the music oh. how it was sung? I didn't know. I don't see uh, this uh, this text with uh, no music. Ah, note. Right. They have not not been preserved, perhaps. Or mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, please. <laughs> uh, one one glossa to your uh, question. Uh, uh, it is almost sure that uh, these songs uh, were sung uh, not on markets or as were uh, like uh, troubadour songs and so on, but perhaps um, it is almost sure that they were uh, they were dedicated to students of Jesuits Collegium and so on, and they performed these songs during these uh, triumphs of Atio uh, and so on. Okay. So so it was uh, uh, they were not dedicated to uh, plebeians to ordinary people. Yeah. Yes, and and uh, uh, thinking about music to them, I know only one uh, specialist in Poland who is interested in discovering a melody to uh, uh, old Polish songs. Wow! <laughs> yeah, is, is only one. Is he or she an ethnomusicologist or a historian? Yeah, he's musicologist. He's ah, musicologist. Right. Yes. Because they they are quite good at at inventing <laughs> how 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 these songs were performed. Yeah, yes. it, it is of course related. But it is to very the much complicated. And, yeah, yeah, to the metric and 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 style and register and, and contrafactura. And, yes, contrafactura uh, taking, and all. Taking, yeah. uh, melody from another songs and so on. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they were borrowed so much from here yeah. and there. It so. might be that they uh, thinking uh, uh, some. Uh, uh, some text uh, in the in the uh, poems, uh, uh, of course, like uh, contrafactura, mm. like uh, Darius. Uh, but it's a popular uh, uh, term. Mm -hmm. um, part, uh, and I presented uh, the. Uh, the, the higher uh, literature. Mm. Yeah, yeah, but it's quite interesting as a media, I think. Mm. Anything else, Joanna, please. Yes, you mentioned the sermons, and I know that you've also written about other sermons previously. And um, then my question is, if you had to classify them, would you count them more as religious literature or more as political uh, writings? Uh, I think that the uh, political, uh, political, 
because they are triumphal sermons, yes, like Peter Skarga took a political sermons past some victory. Yep. Like this, uh, this dam uh, is a is a political uh, topic. Okay, thank you. Because like I was just wondering because I struggle with this thing myself now when I'm you know sorting Mituski's um, library into groups, mm -hmm. and it, it is it is exactly Skarga's uh, sermon. But it, not, but it is not obvious. It is not obvious really. That's why I'm struggling with it, where it should be discussed. In usually these political things are mixed with providentialism. Mm -hmm. It is the, the head of the king was the head of God. Mm -hmm. You know, such concept. Yes, thank you. Thank you, both of you. <laughs> Anything else? If not, then we thank you again, Michal, and, and we will move to the last but not least presentation by Eva, the head of the project that she will introduce us more thoroughly, the basic corpus of Polish Renaissance texts, related to the common heritage of Poland, Finland and Sweden. Project presentation. So thank please. you, Susanna. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Susanna. Uh, my presentation uh, will be in the connection with presentation of Patricia. You have seen uh, already. OK, I will share my screen now. Do you see all my presentation? It is visible for all of you? Yeah, very modern. Okay. <laughs> As you can see, International Multilingual Electronic Corpus of the Old Polish Text, a project of mine, but uh, it is not um, an original project because it is based on Polish version I mean the corpus of the dictionary of the 16th century Polish, uh, as Patricia already mentioned. Okay. Oh, full screen, interrupt me. Okay, now I see everything. Where did the idea for creating uh, this type of corpus come from? Um, it would be a long time to say, to be honest, but I will try to summarize uh, it and say it as briefly as I can. Uh, when I was at a conference in Stockholm um, devoted to the common Polish and Swedish heritage, I learned that there is a shortage or rather lack of researchers who would deal with it, I mean, with old Polish texts. But the problem, I think it's something else. Uh, and I think that it is um, about multi-level obstacles that are set up by uh, old Polish text. Um, the most simple question is how to research something when there is no way to know it? Uh, why? Because the old Polish language is so complicated that even Poles have a problem with this language. And what about Swedes or Finns? Uh, so uh, the accessibility of text is still not enough. Why? Because even uh, digitalization, the process of digitalization did not solve our, all our, our problems with this text. Because when we meet this kind of text, we find a double language obstacle because of old Polish language, but also um, a form of this text. I mentioned about it during my presentation with Nina because we've got manuscripts and uh, Gothic uh, printing, I mean, black letter pr printing. Uh, 
uh, all uh, the materials are of different care. Some of them are carefully, but others are very fuzzy, to be honest, blurred in the instinct. Uh, the handwriting is sloppy and hard to read. Mm, okay. Um, then I uh, then my contacts with Finnish research uh, developed uh, when um, I come back to Poland. Uh, first, I met Mayo Kartinen from the University of Turku, then Susanna Niranen and Anu Lachtinen. Uh, though to Susanna, I also met Natalia Novakowska, who managed the pro project The Jagiellonians at the University of Oxford. And uh, from Natalia, I learned that Polish sources enabling the research um, of the dynasty are hardly accessible and were uh, not used in uh, this project at all. And all this gave rise to the idea of a corpus, thanks to which Polish text would be achievable not only to us Poles, but also for researchers from other countries. So uh, the conclusion of my consideration is, as you can see, Polish text related to the heritage of Jagiellons and Vaza must be translated, especially into English. Then Polish text must be made available in a form that would eliminate these barriers I mentioned. I mean, uh, Gothic letters, uh, manuscripts, and so on. I see the great task, uh, task to lexicographer here because um, they are finest specialists on old Polish language. In cooperation with translators, they are able to create realable, decent translation, translations. Only the translation create in this way makes sense because researchers dealing with the old language will help translate, translators find um, equivalence of old Polish words in contemporary language, which is crucial. Okay, and then what kind of text, what um, kind of collection I propose to translate first and why? Kronika Polska and Kronika Wszystkiego Świata by Marcin Bielski. I mean the Polish Chronicle and cro uh, Chronicle the Entire World by Marcin Bielski. Then Polskie Wypisanie Dwojej Krainy Świata by Mar uh, Maciej Miechowita. The Polish Description Double Land of Sarmatia by Maciej Miechowita. I uh, will uh, talk about this text uh, during my lectures uh, connected with this project. Then, Historia Prawdziwa o Przygodzie Żałosnej Książęcia Jego Mości Finlandzkiego Jana i Królewny Jej Mości Polskiej Katarzyny. Uh, the True History About Miserable Adventure uh, the John, a princess, a prince of Finland, and his wife, a Polish princess Katrine, by Martin Kromer. This text is already translated into Swedish. Yes, I, I, am I right, Susanna? Do you hear me? Yes, now I can hear you. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I was unmuted. <laughs> because I know, I know, I know that uh, the history exists as a Swedish translation already. <clears throat> and it was prepared um, a, a, a hundred years ago, actually. Okay, then the Prawa Królewne in Polish, uh, the bridal trousseau of uh, Catherine Jagiellon. Uh, this is a manuscript uh, of inventory, invent, uh, Catherine inventory, uh, which Nina uh, present us today. Then Psalma Przyjazdu, King Sigmund's arriving from uh, Sweden to Kraków uh, Psalter by Ahadzy Kmita. 
Then, kazanie na obzekwiach żał żałobnych królewnej jej mości polskiej Katarzyny Jagiełówny, which may be, may be translated as sermon at Catherine Jagiellon funeral um, by Szczęsny Skarżyński, and then przedmowa uh, to zielnik by Szymon Syreniusz, dedicated to Anna Waza, I mean preface to E, syreniusz e, herbarium. Ok, and why? Why this specific te text should be translated? Old Polish chroniclers are one of the very first Polish language sources in which we may find detailed information about the royal house of Jagiellon. I mean its origin, its genealogy and so on. This kind of chroniclers are universal one, which means that these monuments are first Polish language sources in which we may find information about northern countries, Sweden, Finland, Iceland, and so on, of course. Then, these texts do not reproduce false stories contained in earlier sources that in this countries lived, for example, strange black people or unusual creatures. Uh, in his um, description, Miechowita uh, says, said that it's all rumors. <laughs> okay, then the Polish, uh, old Polish chroniclers are also distinguished by scientific sobriety, of course, in the some limits of contemporary knowledge. All information they contain a valuable source of historical et et etno ethnographical knowledge. Then, poetic treatises, sermons, occasional poetry, etc., which are an interesting subject of research because of uh, artistic, rhetorical, and also historical values, because they commemorate various uh, very important episodes, events, as such as the arrival of King Zygmunt from Sweden to Kraków, or the funeral of Katarzyna Jagiellonka, and so on. In this text, we will find, of course, a kind of idealized image of people or events celebrated in them, but they are very important because they show what uh, were the Renaissance strategies of creating these images? Then, why Cielnik Herbarium by uh, Szymon Syreniusz? Uh, because of the fact that this is a work of great importance, which shaped medical knowledge, not only of its era. Herbal data, plant properties contained in this book were also successfully used later, so that herbarium was the basis of medical knowledge in principle until the 19th century, actually. Translating this huge work would allow conducting interesting research on the history of ancient medicine, but also on the history of the institution of patronage which um, Professor Hemperek mentioned, because Syreniusz book was created uh, thanks to the support of Anna Vazugna. And then my favorite text with Eva Królewny, The Bridal Trousseau, a work of great importance for not only philologists, because it contains un un unusual, unused word uh, today, but above all for researchers of material culture, like archaeologist histories. It is a reliable source on what the royal trousseau of the bride was like. It allows to reconstruct what items were then used, in what clothes were worn, etc. So it is a kind of very powerful reservoir of knowledge about the material culture of those times, although it is seemingly inconspicuous text, like only a list of things. 
Uh, I think that this kind of multilingual corpus may be um, a kind of solid ba base for research on the Jagiellons, not only in Poland, but also abroad. Creating of an international corpus of Polish Renaissance texts will make to conduct reliable researches based on a solid translation of various sources, which will maybe conduct not only in Poland, but also abroad. Jagiellonians is not only Poland, as we know, but also Finland, Sweden, Lithuania, Germany, Austria, even Moscow. Uh, we have over 300, 300 years of dynasty existential tradition, which was fruitful in enormous, enormous amount of sources and documents. I think that this source shouldn't be neglected in international researchers over Jagiellon's royal house. As Patricia uh, mentioned, uh, the Polish corpus is um, accessible uh, in this link. And uh, Polish corpus uh, contains text from 60th century, which are accessible as a transliteration, which means that it is a notation uh, identical with the original text without right abrade. Okay, <laughs> it was really Ito. briefly, but I think that we are all Ito. tired uh, for, for this day. Uh, I think that uh, creating multilingual electronic corpus of old Polish text is something really important for our common research and discovering our history we shared. And I thank you very much for this meeting. Hitos tak. Dziękuję. Tak. 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 <laughs> okay. Dziękuję, Eva. Yeah, it was very, very uh, nice to know what you are really planning to do. Uh, yeah, and then um, my question goes, uh, how many people would you need to do all that? <laughs> Very good question. Oh, I don't know, but I <laughs> think question. about about eleven, mm -hmm. because I I prepared. A moment, I've got some problem with my camera and with my Zoom. Something okay. I see only Darius Hemperek now. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm back. Uh, I, I uh, prepare a project, as you know, Susanna, and I start in a contest in NPRH um, because I would like to finance my um, this project, the project of multilingual corpus of old Polish text. And I think that uh, 11 people will be enough to create something like that. Of course, I think about some group of text which I mentioned in my presentation only about this text. Mm. So um, would they be uh, diplomatic editions or critical editions? Or... No, no, it will be electronic okay. version. Just as you see uh, during uh, Patricia presentation, it will be identical uh, to the Polish verse version. It will be um, a HTML version or something like that. I don't know this uh, technical uh, details, but it will be looks uh, very similar to Polish ele electronic version of uh, a corpus. So yeah. it will be available only in the internet. And um, I think that uh, thanks of this, it will be also accessible uh, for the people uh, all, all around the world, so mm -hmm. it is uh, my conception. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it's a really ambitious work. That's what I'm wondering here. That that you need to be a philologist and a manuscript uh, book historian, and then an expert in in old Polish and 
and you have to have some uh, skills uh, in digitizing humanities, digitalized humanities, and, and all and that. Translating, the same bunch. And translating, and but translating said, into English. Yes, yes, yeah. Yes, this text uh, will be translated into English, mm -hmm. and then partly also into Swedish and Finnish. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a really kind of a multidisciplinary uh, transnational project. Yes, but, but I think <clears throat> it may be really, really very useful for yeah. all of us. And I think that we should just do it. <laughs> yes, so I'm sure that you have. We are, we are all tired at this point, but I would be happy to hear some comments and Eva as well Okay. on her presentation. Any thoughts, remarks? Everybody is waiting for the digital version of this corpus. <laughs> yeah, but it won't happen soon, I yeah. guess. <laughs> I'll be retired, I'm afraid. <laughs> no, no, I think that we need about four or maybe five years to create uh, it mm -hmm. because it's only a small group of text. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So oh. we can make it, I think. Yeah, but Darius, you raised your hand. Darius. Yeah, just just uh, a small, small uh, uh, adding to, to this uh, great concept, really, that uh, 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 the, the idea is really fantastic, and I hope this, this project will win in this competition mm -hmm. uh, at NPRH uh, uh, grant. Uh, it's a pity that, uh, that uh, of course, uh, I think many of us would like to add some more text, <laughs> but we know. So, so uh, uh, I hope I hope that this 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 uh, uh, th this project will will be done, and after this, another text will will, yes. will appear in this audience. Because, for instance, I have now by Andrzej Zbelitowski very good poem "Droga do Szwecji," yes, I the know. way to Sweden, by Andrzej Zbelitowski, very good source of, for mm -hmm. historians and quite good uh, poetry. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. so, sorry, so, sorry for interrupt you, yeah, but yes, I, yes, I, but, I, but I understand that uh, you have only eleven people, and some texts are so far. Uh, <laughs> yes, some texts are huge. Just mm. no, but I think that the chroniclers uh, will be uh, translated only in a fragment connected with genealogy oh, of uh, Jagiellonian dynasty and something some interesting fact from this perspective like for example the genealogy also of uh, Vaza dynasty which is mentioned in uh, the chronicle of entire world by by, by bielski mm -hmm. and i would like uh, to translate the first, at the very first beginning, uh, the text connected with Polish corpus, because we have uh, a kind of pattern. The Polish corpus is a kind of pattern for us. And it will be uh, easier to um, translate something which almost exists in um, the final form, I think. So your corpus will be the core and then it could be enlarged little by little. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the plan. Yes. And I, I hope we will succeed. And yeah. And if you get the funding, what will happen first? What is your first? <sighs> what will happen first? Uh, we have uh, translate this text. Mm. from old Polish language to contemporary Polish language, because it is the only form um, on which a translator of into English is able to um, work on. Because uh, 
the old Polish language and uh, contemporary Polish, uh, it is the same situation like, I don't know, in Polish and German. Mm -hmm. It's like a two uh, completely different language. Languages. Uh, not completely, but... Not completely. <laughs> They but are in for example, languages, <laughs> it, it depends on the text, I think, because, for example, in the Prava, we've got a really strange word that doesn't not exist in contemporary Polish at all. So some of this text I really are, are really difficult in translation. I think that's why the lexicographers must be involved in this project. Yeah. Yes, that's really interesting, and we really hope for the best for your project. But are there any other remarks or questions to Eva at the end of this workshop? Hmm, seems that no, but we can continue the discussion. Now we know each other a bit better and we have our contact details so we can exchange um, publications and, and events and, and projects and, and so forth. So it has been really useful and, and nice after all these little technical problems we had, but Whoa. never mind, we survived. <laughs> these things happened, so no worries. Anu, please. Um, uh, oh, yes, I, I was actually trying to clap. Uh, ah, okay, sorry, I, I thought clapping. that you wanted Cla to say something. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but I could also uh, add just... Uh, um, um, I would like to thank you, Eva, for organizing this, and uh, and we all know that this has been a very strange and complex year, and and we all even today, unfortunately, we got our share of the problems. But I think it's very good and important to to continue uh, keeping people in touch with each other. And um, and I would like to thank you, Eva, and and everybody who has been involved today, for 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 ta what's the word taking the effort to to be present. So so this is just a general thank you, and and I hope that we will continue in in different ways to keep in touch, whether you have funding or not. <laughs> 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 but but of course we we hope. That, that you'll get it. It it makes things easier. Yeah, yeah but I think that this is the moment to to thank also on my behalf uh, to to all the particip participants and and the, the speakers and uh, discussants. And now I switch to Eva. Perhaps you want to say something. Okay, okay, to, thank you. To wrap uh, up the, the, the workshop. Okay, thank uh, you all. Especially, I would like to thank uh, Miroslava for enabling us to conduct this second part of our meeting. Uh, this was very important for, for me um, and very important part of this project, actually, maybe the most important. Um, Mm. I will inform you, of course, uh, about the progress of our publication in Skandoslavica. Renata Ingbrandt is already uh, with us. Oh, and uh, we've got uh, another visitor, Janusz Małek from UMK. <laughs> uh, and I have set uh, the date uh, with Renata, the date uh, for the e end of March for our uh, for our uh, finished version of our articles, uh, but I have I have to uh, confirm uh, this um, this date with Per Armbroziani, which is editor in chief of of Skandoslavica. So we will uh, in touch uh, all together, and I hope that this group um, will be creative and that. Uh, 
we will uh, continue our common research on Jagiellonian heritage. Thank you, all of you. We will. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you. It was a pleasure to meet you. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. And have a nice oh, evening today. Yeah. yeah. Our a nice relaxing, relaxing <laughs> evening. Yes. Yes. Oh, my yeah. words After also. This relaxing. Old emotions. <laughs> yes. Goodbye. I will. Uh, I, I record uh, this meeting and I will share it uh, on my blog and Facebook. So yeah. <laughs> we will be famous, okay. at least. <laughs> Thank you. Goodbye. Okay, so goodbye. It was. You. It was really great pleasure for me to see all of you. And goodbye. Bye bye. Bye. See you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.